Female Sexual Abuse Advocacy Guide. This section is being presented by Dusty Olson, who is the Advocacy Coordinator at Providence Intervention Center for Assault and Abuse. Dusty was actually one of the authors of the guide put together by WICSAP. Dusty, would you like to go ahead and start? Thank you. We're going to be talking today about medical advocacy. And medical advocacy is, in my opinion, one of the service standards that is probably the most misunderstood. Uh, so let's start with some basis about what medical advocacy is and why it is that it's so important to focus on it in this particular population. Medical advocacy is a core service that we are obligated to provide as a community sexual assault program um, or a crime victim service center as well. And medical advocacy is because victims have a statutory right to have support during their medical evaluations. That was built in because medical examinations or evaluations can be one of the most intimidating processes in a recovery from sexual assault or abuse. People have a lot of preconceived ideas about what the medical evaluation for a sexual assault will be, both when we're talking about adults and when we're talking about children. And those ideas are often really inaccurate, but because they have that preconceived notion, the fear or the anxiety around that is very substantial. And helping people address that fear or anxiety can reduce the intimidation that they feel and allow them to more effectively participate in their medical evaluation. So when we look at the statutory victim rights that uh, sexual assault victims in Washington have, there are a couple that specifically address medical concerns that are important to be aware of uh, in the context of medical advocacy. One is RCW 76930, which indicates that victims have a right to access immediate medical assistance without unreasonable delay. So, for example, if a detective is saying, no, I need to do an interview or I need to get a statement before the medical evaluation, that doesn't have to happen. If there's a medical reason to not delay care for anything that's not urgent, like writing statements or reports, you can't delay medical care for that. So advocating for a victim to have the medical care as soon as they can is helpful. But also get the piece, like I said, that's causing anxiety out of the way so that they're better able to focus on the other parts like writing quality statements or uh, speaking effectively to detectives or investigators. The other victim's rights statute that specifically addresses medical services is RCW 70-125-60. And that is around advocacy services, that statute. And in relation to medical care, it specifically says that victims have the right to have a personal representative of their choosing um, at the healthcare facility or hospital or wherever they're having their medical evaluation. And personal representative is defined under the law as a friend, relative, attorney, employee, or volunteer from a community sexual assault program or specialized treatment service provider. So that would be us as advocates. If they want to have an advocate present, they have a right to do that. Not all medical providers are accustomed to working with advocates. So just like sometimes we have to say to police officers, the victim has a right to have me here, we may have to say to medical providers that same thing. She would like me to stay. This family would like me to be here. I, they have a right to have that, and here's the RCW that indicates that. Now, if you're working with a specialized medical provider like a SANE team or um, a sexual assault response team, a forensic nurse, or some uh, provider like through a children's advocacy center that does this a lot, they're us usually used to working with advocates and it's not going to be an issue. But in some programs where the, the medical evaluation is being done by an emergency room doctor, for example, they're usually not accustomed to having another person, another professional involved in their evaluations, so you may have to be able to cite this particular RCW. So what is medical advocacy? Medical advocacy has to do with 
making sure that somebody understands the medical evaluation that they're going to be receiving, that they know what will be happening as a result of the evaluation, they know the purpose of the evaluation, uh, that they have all their questions answered about the evaluation, uh, referring them to appropriate medical resources. So if they call the crisis line and it's clear that a medical evaluation is necessary, knowing who in the community to refer them to, knowing uh, what other resources they need if they need follow-up care like STD testing or uh, additional medical follow-up that maybe is not available from the provider that did their original evaluation. Actually being there to support them at the medical exam and the appointment if that's what they wish. And then also included in the, the service standard under medical advocacy is the discussion of the crime victim's compensation benefits and helping them understand what will and won't be covered as part of their medical evaluation by crime victim's compensation. It's important to understand that medical advocacy is about what you're talking about, not where you are. So you can be doing medical advocacy on the crisis line from your office. You could be doing medical advocacy at the police station if you're talking to somebody about what might be appropriate medically after they're done with their report. You can be doing medical advocacy in your office or you can be doing medical advocacy at the hospital. It's about the content that is medically oriented, not about your location. It was clear to me that sometimes this isn't easily understood when I was helping a program develop additional medical advocacy resources and she was talking to me about, well, yes, we do a medical advocacy, we respond to the hospital all the time. And as we were talking, we were talking about what she was talking about at the hospital. <coughs> Excuse me. And it was clear that what she was doing was legal advocacy at the hospital. She was talking about police reporting and the criminal justice system and the investigation process and all of those pieces in the emergency room and not really talking at all about the medical evaluation or those pieces. Uh, that's a normal mistake that occurs because people are like, oh, I'm at the hospital, I must be doing medical advocacy. You're doing legal advocacy if those are the content pieces you're talking about. You're doing medical advocacy if what you're talking about is the medical appointment and the medical services. I think as victim advocates, we tend to be more comfortable with the legal piece and more fluent in our knowledge about that, so that's what we tend to focus on. So really bolstering knowledge about the medical piece so that that's the advocacy that we're delivering when it's appropriate is an important step. I am very fortunate. Uh, our program is actually a department of our area's hospital, and we have our same team, our sexual assault nurse team that runs right out of our same department. So we have collaboration with our medical services built in, but I, I know that that's an exception and it's actually an extremely rare exception. And so most programs have to look at opportunities to collaborate with medical providers that are outside of their uh, sphere of immediate influence. So how do you find medical providers and begin to collaborate with those people that are going to be providing medical services to the kids that you're seeing. And in a lot of places, even if you have a good existing relationship with your SANE team, that's probably not who will be doing medical evaluations for children. Um, there are additional training and uh, guidelines and skills for SANE nurses to work with pediatric populations, and not a lot of them do. Ours do, but that's the exception rather than the rule. So even if you have a really good established relationship with your same team for your adult survivors that you're working with, that may not be who is working with the children that you're trying to establish this program for. <laughs> so when you're beginning to try to collaborate with medical services or increase your professional working relationship with them, first and foremost, you have to know what's available. So you have to know who is it that's going to be seeing pediatrics in your area. Is it going to be your same team? Is it going to be uh, a pediatric uh, gynecologist, which those are very rare? Is it going to be a doctor who has specialized training in your community? Is it going to be the medical provider at the Children's Advocacy Center? 
there's a lot of different options for what that can look like. And it may look different for prepubescent or young kids and postpubescent or teenagers. So really knowing who the medical providers in your community are that are going to be providing these resources. And then also needing to know what other resources are available in your community that victims may need to access. So for example, at our program, our pediatric uh, patients don't have lab work, blood tests, their STD testing done in our office because we don't want them to affiliate shots and blood draws with their provider here. So their lab work is all done at another location. So knowing where that is and when they have to do that, if they have follow-up testing, for example, that needs to be done, our advocates need to know all of those pieces. When you are beginning to establish a relationship with the medical service providers in your community, you really need to start from a place of selling yourself to them. You need to know why you're valuable, and which you do, but you need to be able to explain to them why you're valuable to them. So the same thing that we often use with, uh, for example, detectives about uh, people will better be able to cooperate if the advocate's involved, they will experience less trauma, they will be less stressed, they will require less uh, intensive follow-up. All of those types of reasons that we use to sell why advocates are valuable to be involved, you need to sell those to medical providers as well. The best way to, to develop a working relationship with somebody is for them to know that you make their life easier. So if you can sell yourself in that way, it will be very valuable. They need to know that they need you. So when they have positive experiences and things go easier when you're involved, then they're more likely to have to encourage or seek that involvement. The other thing that you need to do is make sure that you're informing victims along the way that they have a right to have an advocate with them during their medical procedures. If clients begin to ask, I want my advocate here, then the medical providers will start to connect that that's an important thing to have and that it's not a fluke, that you're not going away. So when we're talking about children, it's very important as an advocate to understand the laws pertaining to child health care rights in the state of Washington, what they can and can't do on their own. And one of the reasons it's very helpful for an advocate to be really fluent in these is because this is sometimes a contentious issue with parents. Um, as a parent myself, I understand how a parent can be annoyed that their child has a right to something that they may not get to make decisions about as a parent. So it's important that you're really well versed in these and understand and be able to explain the, the reasoning and the rationale behind them to clients. So for most healthcare services, the age of majority, which means the age of being able to, to consent for healthcare is 18. However, Washington has put some specific provisions in place so that children under 18 can have control of their health care decisions outside of their parents and even independent of parental permission. So sexually transmitted disease testing and treatment uh, and is at 14. So if they want to do STD testing or STD treatment after the age of 14, they have the right to do that without any parental consent. Birth control and reproductive health is at any age. So Washington state law says a child at any age can seek reproductive health care at any age without parental consent. Now, it's important to understand how the health care provider that you are working with interprets sexual assault care or sexual abuse evaluations. Our program medical staff interprets sexual abuse evaluations as a component of reproductive health. But for the most part, they do, at 14, begin to allow kids to sign their own services. But if they have a child who comes in who's younger, who, for example, doesn't have a parent with them, they will consider it to be reproductive health and see that child. So you need to know what the specific policies are for the provider that you're working with. Do they consider a sexual abuse evaluation to be reproductive health and will see them regardless? Do they use the sexually transmitted disease testing age of 14 because it has sexually in it, just like sexual abuse? 
what is their policies and procedures because it's not clearly defined under the law. Um, if you want more information about the specific children's medical rights for Washington, there's a really good resource at www.washingtonlawhelp.org, and they have a PDF file there that you can download called Providing Healthcare to Minors Under Washington Law, which breaks down all of the age of consent issues for minors for healthcare in Washington. It's important to understand how this relates to advocacy, though, because it may not match up. There are, under the law, there are no designations for at which point a child can seek advocacy services on their own. Um, some programs interpret that to mean that a child at any age can, can consent for their own advocacy care. Some programs have come up with other standards. Personally, our program uses 13 because that's the age at which children can consent to mental health treatment without parental consent, and we decided that mental health was the closest fit to victim advocacy, but there aren't actually any statutes that specifically define that for you. Remember that when you are providing medical advocacy to children, it's sometimes tricky to remember or know who the client is. If I have a case of sexual abuse where the victim is three, I am not going to sit down with that victim and say, I want you to understand the evaluation that you're about to have and here's the way that that information is going to be used and here's the things that the investigator is looking for and all of those pieces about how the medical evaluation ties into the investigation or giving them information about the medical evaluation. I'm going to do all that to the parent. I'm going to have all that conversation with the, with the mom or the dad or both. But the child is the client. So the child is the victim. The child is, is as an advocate, who we are advocating for. We are working through the parents because we know that supporting the parents and reducing the parents' anxiety is the best for the child. But the child is actually the client. And there are occasionally times where remembering that the parents are not your client and the child is, is helpful because the interests of the child and the interests of the parents are not always the same. And so as an advocate, remembering that you're there to be a support for the child and to advocate for the rights of the child um, are the most important. That's a lot easier as the child gets older and you're talking to the child and you're making sure that the child get, is getting their questions answered and you're working directly with the child. It's much easier to remember that, but it's, it's important to keep that in mind regardless of the age of the child. Also remember that if a child is old enough to consent to services, they're old enough to decline services. So if you have a 14-year-old, for example, in your program and the medical provider uses 14 as the age of consent and the medical provider is talking to the child and the child says, nothing happened, I wasn't sexually assaulted and I don't want you looking at me down there, they just decline services. And our role as an advocate is to support them in that choice and make sure that other people, <coughs> excuse me, whether that's the parent or the medical professional, hear their, their wishes and respect them. So it, you cannot and you will have parents that will say, you will do this exam on my kid. And as an advocate, it's important to remember that they have the right to control their own body. That's that's ultimately the message in sexual abuse prevention that we want to use all the time is that children have a right to control what happens to themselves and we need to model that and we need to have the medical providers and, and hopefully parents model that for children as well. So that can potentially be an area where issues occur. Um, if children are able to consent to services on their own, they get to control their information. So they get to say, I don't want you to tell my mom that I have gonorrhea. Um, I don't want you to tell my mom, you know, what I told you happened uh, to the medical provider. So they have a right to control that information as well. And that can be an issue for parents sometimes. It's very difficult for a parent 
for somebody to tell them, you don't have a right to have information about your child. And so being able to explain to them that the purpose for that is so that their child is comfortable seeking the medical care that they need, that they're comfortable being open and honest with the medical provider, and that it's really designed so that we can provide or the medical provider can provide the best possible care for the child without any barriers. So learning how to finesse that with parents is particularly important. So I often will tell parents that I understand how difficult that is, uh, that hearing that information is, is important, and as a parent you always want all of the information you can possibly have about how your child's doing. But the reason the law is written that way is that so that every child, regardless of, of the type of relationship they have with their parents, is able to get the care that they need without any fear or concerns. And if your child agrees to let you have that information, we're more than happy to give it to you, but we need to make sure that we can provide them the best possible care to make sure that they're healthy and well taken care of, and that's why this law is in place. So being able to help smooth that over is a, is a wonderful skill as an advocate to have. Sometimes, if you have parents that have a really high need for uh, support around their child's abuse and you have a child that's maybe not comfortable giving their parent a lot of information, that's really a time to look at, is this a family that needs two advocates? Does the child need an advocate that they know is just for them and they don't have to worry about their parents getting any information, but the parents still then have a support person that they can talk to and ask questions of, who is not giving them specific information about the child, but is still available to be a resource and a support person to them. And that helps the child feel safe because the person their parent is talking to is not the person that they are talking to. Um, and this can be particularly valuable around medical settings because they're sharing sometimes a lot of really sensitive information with the medical provider. Um, our medical providers ask questions about their consensual sexual activity. They ask questions about their drug use, their alcohol use, their smoking, um, at previous sexual experiences, previous abuse experiences, domestic violence. Um, so kids may not be comfortable answering all those questions as honestly as we want them to with the medical provider if they're concerned about their parent getting that information. So whatever we can do to help them feel like their information that they're providing the medical provider is protected and confidential, if that's how they want it to be, then that's what we need to do. So a lot of people will ask, well, why does my child need an evaluation? Why do they need a medical assessment? So the purpose of a medical assessment is to document the history. That's probably the most important thing about the medical evaluation is the documentation of the history. Most people think of it really as a physical examination, but the physical examination often doesn't yield a whole lot of information, particularly with young kids. So the documentation of the history is usually the most important piece. I know in our appointments, it may take two hours with a child, two, two and a half hours for a medical appointment, a medical evaluation on a kid, and three quarters of that is talking and getting the history, the history from the parent and then, if old enough, a history from the child. Another reason, obviously, is to locate injuries. That's not a real common concern, and we'll talk about why that is later. To assess and treat medical conditions. Um, so if kids have bladder infections or yeast infections or any other medical condition, they to be assessed and treated. Um, to reassure the child and the parent, and this is a big one. Um, Parents are often really worried that their children are damaged. Um, it's amazing how many people in our culture still have this idea that there's uh, this hymen that you pop the first time um, somebody has sex, and so some parents are really worried about uh, physical damage as a result of that, or is their child still a virgin? Kids are sometimes worried that they're, because something was maybe painful, they're scarred or disfigured. Um, somebody will be able to tell that something happened to them when they choose to have consensual sex at some point in the future. Uh, what the worries and concerns are often vary greatly from age to age, but being able to reassure, reassure children and their parents that physically they're okay and healthy is the most valuable thing that an exam can do. 
it's often a good opportunity to educate. Um, the education needs to come at the end of the evaluation, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But it's a good opportunity to teach uh, young kids about their bodies and sometimes to teach parents about kids' bodies. Um, one of the main reasons that a medical provider should be involved has actually to do with the criminal justice system in that there are very few circumstances anymore where anybody can get up in court and say, here's what this child told me, because it's hearsay. The, one of the exceptions to that is medical providers. The law accounts for what's called a medical exception to hearsay, and it's based on the idea that people tell medical providers the truth because it's in their best interest to tell them the truth so that they get the best care and they're, they're physically taken care of. So a medical provider can go up on the stand in court and present the information about what a child told them in a medical evaluation without there being hearsay issues. So often we want children to tell medical providers what has happened even if they've told somebody else. And then obviously to identify potential evidence in the case, whether that's forensic evidence or injuries. Uh, <clears throat> The important thing to remember, though, is that we shouldn't be telling anybody how to do their job. The decision about whether or not a medical evaluation should be provided in a case should be the decision of a medical provider, not an advocate, not a detective, not even a parent, per se. A parent obviously can make that decision, but they should be making it in consultation with a medical provider. So medical decisions should be made by medical people. Um, as advocates, if we get calls on the crisis line or somebody comes into our office, we certainly can tell them, here's our standard procedure for when we do and don't refer to medical, here's the advantages of a medical evaluation, here's what it entails, we can address concerns, but saying that somebody does or doesn't need one is outside the scope of what we should be doing as an advocate. Um, Saying somebody doesn't need a medical evaluation is a medical decision, and a medical provider should be doing that. Sometimes personal beliefs can interfere um, with referring children to medical evaluations because even a lot of professionals are misinformed about what they are. I've had a lot of law enforcement officers, I've had a lot of CPS officers, uh, CPS investigators say, well, we don't need to put the child through that. That's too traumatic. Um, that's too invasive. It doesn't make sense in this case. Medical evaluations are not traumatic and invasive for child sexual abuse. People assume that they are because that's a, a misperception that they have. They have either um, an adult idea of a rape evaluation or they are are just assuming the worst. And so if they're making judgments based on not wanting to put children through trauma rather than is it medically sound, is it investigation, investigatively sound, they're making decisions with the wrong pieces of information. And there's lots of reasons to conduct an evaluation, um, even years after the abuse, even if it's abuse that you know is probably not going to leave any marks like uh, touching, even if it has nothing to do with evidence or case building, um, it goes often back to that reassuring the parent and the child. We've had kids who are sure that they were pregnant. Um, we've had boys that were sure that they were pregnant. We've had kids that are sure that because they have discharge sometimes that they have STDs. We've had kids that um, have been worried for years about medical pieces and that's something that they've been pondering on this whole time they hadn't told anybody that there was an abuse. And if if a medic if a investigator says, oh well, it was you know three years ago that this happened, and they don't ask the right questions, they might not know that that's a particular worry of the child. It's a medical provider's job to assess those things. So there's lots of reasons to conduct an examination or evaluation that that may not be apparent at first glance. <coughs> As I said, there's a lot of people who genuinely misunderstand what a child sexual abuse evaluation is. And so they 
are really concerned about the trauma for the child associated with that. Parents and, like I said, other professionals. Uh, a child sexual abuse evaluation is nothing like an adult rape exam. We don't use, uh, nobody uses speculums on little kids. It's not an internal vaginal exam. It's not invasive. It's, it's really just an external check of the child's genitals um, with hopefully proper magnification equipment so that they're able to see because children's genitals are tiny. And um, the actual physical evaluation, the genital portion of the evaluation, for the most part, is a few minutes. So we'll have kids that come into our medical clinic and maybe the parents are really worried or the kids are really worried. Um, usually kids are really worried as a result of parents being really worried. Uh, and the evaluation is so quick and so non-invasive that everybody's so relieved afterwards and kids are like, oh, this was great, I'll see you later. I'm gonna be your, you're, gonna, you're my new doctor. It's, it's not traumatic. Um, in all the years that I've worked here in this program, so I've been here eight years now, I can count on one hand the number of cases where a child was actually physically traumatized as a result of the evaluation. And most of those had to do with either the parent being so upset that the, the child got upset or that there were a couple of cases where there were some fairly substantial injuries. And that's very rare. But if we can give them information about the evaluation, the and decrease their anxiety, the more successful it will be. Um, the more anxious a parent is about the evaluation, the more fear or anxiety that a child genuinely demonstrates. And we have a, a provider here on staff who contacts the family beforehand and explains the entire evaluation process, explains that it's not traumatic, gives them suggestions about how to talk to their children, answers all their questions, but sometimes people walk in the door and they're genuinely afraid. And if parents are genuinely afraid, kids are gonna pick up on that, even if they've never expressed that to the child. So if we can reduce the parental anxiety, we can help the kids have a lot more positive experience. Research has actually shown that uh, when they've done pre and post evaluations in child sexual abuse medical exams, uh, that there is not nearly as much trauma as there had been anticipated to be. So the, the anticipation is much worse than the actual event. So if we can reduce the anxiety by providing them information and helping them be fully informed about procedures, the better. So when we have families get here, the advocate and the medical provider take the parent separate them from the child almost immediately when, they, when they're when they here. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold. Um, we separate them almost immediately, and the purpose of that is to be able to take the parent right away and answer all their questions and tell them exactly what's going to happen so that they can be calm, and it gives the child a chance to be in the, in the exam room, which in our exam room is really fun and full of toys, and um, it gives them some time to calm down and reduce their anxiety independent of the parent. So if we can give the parent lots of information about what it's gonna be like, and the number one question that parents ask is, is something gonna go inside my child or is it gonna hurt? Because uh, most moms, well all moms probably have had a gynecological exam and they are envisioning that exam for their child. And so being able to explain to them that a, a a prepubescent or a young child sexual assault evaluation is completely external, that nothing's gonna be inserted in the vagina, um, that it won't feel or seem a whole lot different to a kid than any other well child check that they're gonna to go to can reduce that, that anxiety a lot. So what an exam looks like, because we're gonna talk a little bit now about different types of child sexual abuse exams. What an exam looks like, somewhat's gonna depend on where it is. So in your community, you may have evaluations being done in the emergency department by an emergency room doctor. You may have a specialized provider that works in a clinic. You may have a sexual assault specific provider like a scene nurse or a forensic nurse. You may have a children's advocacy center. 
that has a medical provider that, that specializes in child sexual abuse evaluations, or you may have a general practitioner that uh, is just the person who's been designated to do that. So it's going to look a little different. As you can assume, somebody who specializes in these evaluations is going to be a little more confident, a little more comfortable, have probably done a lot more of them. It's probably going to flow smoother, and um, they're probably going to have more skills in their toolbox to be able to address issues. If you are having this done at the emergency department by an ED doctor or a general practitioner, there may be a little more need on your part to um, support the parents. It may not flow as well. The provider may not be as versed or comfortable in some of the supportive language or information giving around sexual assault or abuse because that's not really what they do. So medically, examinations are sort of divided into prepubescent and postpubescent. So pre and post puberty, essentially. So uh, there's not an age at which that is. Um, it's that's just a time frame. So we're going to start by talking about postpubescent because that's more similar to what most people are familiar with because it's fairly similar to an adult sexual assault evaluation. So if you have a teenager who comes in, they're going to get something that's pretty similar to if you have an adult rape victim who comes in. You're more likely to have a teenage evaluation done by a SANE nurse that would do an adult sexual assault evaluation than you would have a young child who would be seen by a SANE nurse in your community, perhaps. So when they come in, their first thing is the history, um, which is they're looking for what happened, um, how they may have gotten hurt, what they need to assess for. Um, our providers are assessing for assessment of sexual knowledge to know whether or not they uh, know a lot about sex so that they can feel confident if they ever have to testify that a child is, um, you know, was not particularly versed in sexual knowledge, that that's an important thing for potentially a criminal investigation. They're assessing their health history, their GYN or their sexual history, and then a review of systems, which is how the rest of their general health is, eyes, nose, ears, throat, heart, all those things. Um, a post-pubescent sexual assault exam may or may not include a speculum exam. So as an advocate, you never want to say you will or won't have something because a um, because young teens will ask about this. Well, am I going to have to have that thing inside me? Well, whether or not they have to have a speculum often depends on what happened. Um, it depends on their previous sexual history. It depends on whether or not they've had a speculum exam before. I often will say something like, well, if you've had, have you had that kind of exam before? Have you had a women's health checkup before? Then it's probably going to be very similar to that. But you don't want to say they will or won't have something. Most forensic nurses do not want a, a teen's first sexual health examination, their first sexual, um, their first speculum exam to be in the context of a sexual assault. So they'll only do that if that's absolutely necessary. Um, so you don't, as an advocate, ever want to say what will or won't happen in a medical evaluation because those are decisions that the medical provider needs to make. You can say things like, well, you can ask about that. You can say things like, um, it's usually similar to, to women's health exams that you may have had before because if they've had one before, they probably would have a speculum exam, but you don't want to say that for sure. Um, so you want to be careful as an advocate that you're not providing definitives about what they can expect. Um, a post possessant examination also is going to include treatment for things like STDs, treatment for any injuries, tre treatment for, um, but we do preventative medications if they're within certain time frames to prevent pregnancy, to prevent gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, there is the option with teenagers to do HIV preventative medication, but that's very unusual. So those options, just like in an adult sexual assault evaluation, those options are going to be available to teens. But again, you want to be explaining as the advocate that these are things the medical provider can talk to you about, not that they will or won't do. Emergency contraception is available to 
um, post-pubescent victims, so victims that are having their period and may have concerns about getting pregnant, they do have the option to have that. Um, the law requires the hospital to provide it, uh, but there are times where hospitals don't always follow that law or providers don't always follow that law, particularly, I think, with teenagers. So you need, as an advocate, to be prepared to offer ways to, to access emergency contraception in your community if the hospital doesn't provide it. That may be pharmacies, that may be Planned Parenthood, that may be other providers, but knowing what those are is important. In prepubescence, so prior to puberty, younger kids. Um, in prepubescent sexual um, assault assessments, there are a couple of really important things. One is talking to the parent alone, because in young kids, we don't talk about sexual abuse in front of them, because they're suggestionable and that potentially damages some of the concepts of medical exception to hearsay. Um, so the provider should be talking with the caregiver alone. So if you're in the room and the, the medical provider walks in and starts saying, okay, I'd like to find out what happened and everybody's still all together, um, you want to say, excuse me, is it possible that we can have this discussion outside of the, the presence of the child? Um, so when they're talking with the caregiver alone, they need to be getting an abuse history, a social history, which is just about the family. Um, and they're assessing protectiveness. Is this parent supportive? Are they going to protect this child from the, the concern of the alleged offender? Then the medical provider is generally talking to verbal children alone. Remember I said that medical providers have the medical exception to hearsay. So if a child tells the medical provider, you know, this is what happened to me and, and you know, Uncle Johnny touched me, the medical provider can then testify to that in court because the child said Uncle Johnny touched her. But they should not be doing an interview. This is not a forensic interview like a law enforcement investigation would do. This is a history. It's about primarily obtaining medical information. The medical exception to hearsay law makes that very clear. The child has to understand that they're there for a medical evaluation, and the medical evaluation has to be completely independent of any investigation for law enforcement for the medical exception to hearsay to apply. So. It, it's not um, a forensic interview. It is a medical history taking that often has the opportunity for kids to discuss what happened to them. Uh, it's important that education for kids happen after that discussion because you don't want them to be learning new information in the context of a, a medical evaluation because it can taint their history uh, in the criminal case. So. Medical providers that do this routinely are very conscientious about what they can or cannot do or say. So as an advocate, you need to remember that at this point when they're talking to the child or even sometimes when they're talking to the parent, you are there as a support per person. This is the medical provider's appointment, and you should not be trying to encourage the child to say things or asking follow-up questions to things that the child answers or follow-up questions to the medical provider answers. You should be there in a supportive role. Your role to provide information and referrals and those kind of things needs to happen outside of this history taking so that it has the greatest likelihood of being able to come into court effectively. Then there's the exam and then there's a developmental assessment. So uh, where are kids at developmentally? So the exam, let me go back one slide here. The exam is basically a head-to-toe checkup with genitals thrown in. So it's a few minutes. It's eyes, ears, nose, throat, stomach, lungs, heart, breathe, um, all that stuff. And now we're going to look at where you go to the bathroom from. So it's generally pretty quick. It's usually a couple minutes. The provider may have specialized equipment like a colposcope, so you need to be able to explain what a colposcope is to a family. Um, the best way that I know to explain a colposcope is it looks like a 1980s video camera, and what it is is a camera that magnifies everything so that the provider is able to 
uh, only have the child on the exam table for just a couple of minutes and then is able to look at that video in magnification after the fact to be uh, looking to document any injuries or concerns. That's exactly how I explain it. As far as treatment for prepubescent kids, um, that's all based on the history. Um, we, for example, don't do STD testing standardly on kids unless there's some reason in the history or to, to be concerned about body fluid exposure, for example. Um, our medical provider insists that STD testing um, that's not urine-based testing happen somewhere else. Because we're part of the Children's Advocacy Center, kids have to come back to our facility a lot sometimes, and we want them to have a positive experience. So we don't want to poke them with needles while they're here. So they go to an independent lab with lab orders that our medical provider um, provides and has their lab work done there and at a, a different day and time. Uh, we do that very carefully. Um, they may have urine testing that we do urine. Um, our providers do urine testing on uh, just about every kid that they can get urine out of just uh, to rule out infections to test for gonorrhea and commit chlamydia. It's important to know that uh, any time there's a positive STD result in a child, they have to be retested. So it's not a single shot deal if there's ever a positive STD result. So if you have a child who, if you're working with a family who's gonna have a medical assessment, you're advocating for them. Prior to their assessment, um, you may be the one that's referring them for an assessment or um, you want to be maybe explaining why an assessment is important, which are all the reasons that we've talked about. You want to be explaining the general procedures and the content of the assessment. So you want to feel comfortable knowing what those are. You want to help the parents understand the, the, the health care rights, the things about consent and confidentiality that we talked about, about why a child has a right to have that information, have that protection under the law. You want to be talking with the medical providers and the patients about concerns, questions, and delays. So if they're running late, if um, you know, the, the time before a medical assessment is often really anxious, like I said. So if you know that a child's particularly anxious or a parent's particularly anxious, um, you know, communicating that with a medical provider. You know, remember I said that in a three-hour appointment that we have with a kid, the medical evaluation usually takes 10 minutes. Um, and it's the end. If I have a teenager or even a little bit younger child who I know is really nervous about the, the exam part, I may talk to the medical provider and we may say, you know what, let's do that part first and get it over with because then everybody can relax and we can actually get a good history from the parent and the child. And so if, if there's things like that that would be helpful, to facilitate the process, as an advocate, speak up. You may not always get what you want, but it certainly doesn't hurt to ask on behalf of your client. Um, providing information about potential delays is important too. For example, in our emergency room, uh, the, the doctor has to screen the patient before they leave, even though the forensic nurse has already seen them. Um, and sometimes that takes a really long time. And just explaining to parents, for example, that the reason that they can't leave is because there's another patient in the emergency room who's having a heart attack and the doctor has to attend to that before they can come and, and screen the child to leave. So giving them accurate information so that they understand what's going on is helpful. As an advocate in a medical setting, you do not ever want to provide food or water, okay? Food or water can... Um, cause issues with medical procedures, it can damage forensic evidence, it can delay medical care if necessary. So you want to make sure that a medical provider has always cleared a patient to have food or drink prior to us giving it to them. Before the assessment, we don't want to expose children to conversations about sexual abuse because we want them to be able to, to say whatever it is that they're going to say to the medical provider without any external influence so that the medical provider is able to talk about that in court. So if you meet with a family prior to their evaluation and the child's in there and the mom starts asking all sorts of questions, you just want to say, you know what, I will make sure that we get those answers, but we're going to talk about that when we have a few minutes alone. 
um, or the, the doctor comes in and starts talking in front of the child, you want to put a stop to that. Uh, you want to be careful. You don't want to introduce yourself as a sexual assault advocate in front of a young child. Um, you know, a, a 12, 13, 14-year-old, they know why they're there, um, and you want to treat them with respect and make sure that you are answering their questions. A 5-year-old, you don't want to introduce yourself that way because they may not know the words sexual assault, and we don't want to introduce those words to them. Um, once the assessment's been completed, then based on the kid's age and developmental understanding, you can sit down with them as the advocate and answer all their, the, all their questions. So often if I have a kid that's um, younger, like seven or eight, um, I don't talk to them a lot up front before the assessment. But after the assessment, I'll take a few minutes to sit down alone with them and say, you know, my job is to make sure that you understand what's happening and that you don't have any questions and what are you worried might happen next and, and have those discussions and conversations with them. During the actual assessment, what should you be doing as an advocate? Um, remember I talked about the importance of the history and the, the medical questions, both of the parent and the child that the provider is getting. If you are talking during that time, you are potentially changing that evidence. So during the history, your advocacy is second. Now, if somebody gets really upset and starts falling apart, you may have to step in and, and ask if they can have a break or um, provide some crisis intervention or some, some emotional support. If somebody throughout the history, if a parent, for example, throughout the history is saying things like, I should have known, I shouldn't have done this, I can't believe I, and you're hearing all these things about them feeling guilty or responsible, um, take a note of that. But wait until the history is done to have that conversation. You may say something like, I'm hearing a lot of things about you feeling really responsible about what happened. I want you to know we'll take a minute to talk about that when you're finished with Dr. So-and-so. Um, so providing support and comfort but not derailing the history is important as an advocate. You're going to behave a little differently, as I've alluded to all along, with older kids and younger kids. Um, my general kind of age guideline around that is 10. Under 10, I wait until after. Over 10, I talk to them before, and just not extensively, but just to make sure that they don't have any questions, that they're not concerned, make sure all that gets addressed. Um, that's kind of broken down on the age at which the court has generally assessed that a child or is or is not suggestible. Um, but some of that's developmental. I've had some kids that are eight that are really mature that really want to have intense conversations about what's going on. Um, and I've had some kids that are, you know, 11 or 12 that really just want to get in and get out and they don't aren't really connected to why they're there. You want to address fears um, if there if any discussion comes up during the medical evaluation or the history about them being afraid you want to make sure that that gets addressed during the actual physical assessment you may be there to su provide support and comfort for the child um, you're not wanting to participate in the physical assessment so if a child needs um, some assistance holding still for example as the advocate you don't want to be doing that you can help the parent do that you know, you can give the parent feedback about it would be real helpful if you could help her lie still by, you know, um, keeping her shoulders on the bed or, um, you know, gently um, trying to, you know, I describe it as, as cuddling with her to, you know, help her stay still. Um, but you as the advocate don't want to be doing that. Uh, one of the most important things that the advocate can be doing during the actual physical assessment is helping the parent focus and maintain composure. The parent needs to be focused on the child's face and interacting with the child and reassuring them and being positive and upbeat. If the parents are trying to look to see what's going on, um, they're not focused. If they're really upset, you know, that's not helpful. If they are doing things like, um, I had a parent one time who was leaning over and going, it's okay, mommy's right here, I'm not ever gonna let him hurt you, don't worry, don't worry. And this child wasn't worried until her mom started doing all of that. So really as the advocate, 
keeping an eye on the parent and helping them do the most positive thing, um, helping them be supportive without being conveying fear, helping them be focused on their child without being um, overly anxious, helping them main, uh, maintain positive support. So I'll say, okay, can you, why don't you guys, for young kids, I'll do things like, mom, can you help her sing her ABCs? Can you, um, let's talk about, I'll, I'll try to engage mom and the kid in conversations about school or pets or sports or so that there's some positive interaction between the parent and the child going on, and before you, they know it, then the exam part's over. After the exam comes the discussion about what was found. What did the medical provider find? Um, most children do not have any significant medical findings. 80% uh, of kids, there's no medical finding. Um, that's because what most sex offenders do, like touching and, and rubbing and um, looking, doesn't leave physical marks. But it can be really difficult for parents to hear that, um, both positive and negative. It's, it's very interesting because some parents will hear your child, there's no, there's no evidence of trauma, and what they hear is nothing happened, which is really not the same thing. <clears throat> or what they hear is we're not going to be able to prove that something happened, and they're very upset. Um, so they can be really upset even if what we would potentially perceive to be positive information, that your child has no injuries. So really trying to help them reframe that as a positive, but reiterating that that doesn't mean that nothing happened, and that doesn't mean that there's not any way that a criminal case can proceed. Uh, talking about the fact that um, how sex offenders engage in their behaviors and what are common sex offense behaviors, and that it's typical because of those types of behaviors that they're not injuries. Then you can have the flip side to, you know, have a child who is injured, and that's often extremely emotionally distressing for parents. Um, everybody nowadays expects forensic evidence. Um, people watch CSI and Law and & Order and all these shows, and they expect there to be forensic evidence collection. Um, forensic evidence collection, when we're talking about kids, really varies widely depending on the assault. When you're talking about a post adolescent teenager, it may be very similar to an adult rape evaluation. But on a young child, um, often there's not forensics. Often when we're talking about children's uh, abuse, we're talking about things that may have occurred quite some time because we know that most kids delay their reporting. Um, so there's often not forensics. And in cases where we know that abuse just occurred, Often the forensics come from other portions of the investigation, whether that's bedding in the child's room um, where forensics are, or clothing for, with forensics. There's often not forensics on children, but people expect forensics. So being able to have a discussion about the fact that there's normally not forensic evidence with young kids is important. Um, it's important to remember that healthcare providers have certain confidentiality requirements in place because of HIPAA. Uh, which protects uh, protected health information, which protected health information is pretty much any information about a patient. Um, if you are trying to work cooperatively with a medical provider, you may need to have some formal agreements in place between your agency and the medical agency so that they can address HIPAA. Um, if nothing else, they're going to have to have a release from the patient to talk with you about any information. Um, if the patient asks for you to be present, that's a an implied consent, but only for that time when you all three are together. So if you go to a medical evaluation with a child and the next day the parent calls you and says, you know what, I didn't understand when the, when the medical provider said this, if there's not a release in place, or if there's not a formal memorandum um, in place between your agencies, you're not going to be able to call the medical provider and get it, even though you were just there the day before. So just like we would protect a client's confidentiality in that same way, a medical provider will as well. So if you have a medical provider that you're working with very regularly, um, let's say they're the only provider doing pediatric evaluations in your community, 
it's probably worth exploring a memorandum of agreement or a memorandum of understanding between your agency and the health care agency so that you can work cooperatively and communicate with each other. If you are working with a medical agency that is outside of your agency, which I know most people will be, um, you need to remember that you continue to be a mandated reporter. So the medical provider is a mandated reporter and they will make reports, but you are also a mandated reporter. So if you are aware of an information, you have to report that, even if you believe the medical provider will also report it. You can't abdicate your mandatory reporting responsibilities to another individual. Um, and so you want to follow your agency's protocol on what your reporting responsibilities are. So just in conclusion, um, a couple of really key things as you're working with child sexual abuse evaluations and medical providers in your community. You want to know who your providers are. You want to know why they're doing what they're doing. Um, so one of the best things to do is to have the medical provider in your community who's doing these evaluations come and train your staff come and talk about what they're doing so that you can feel comfortable in talking about what's going to happen and why that's happening because the why is often the piece that helps reduce the anxiety. Um, avoid at all costs, um, and this is true of adults and children exams, but avoid at all costs of telling the patient what the nurse or the provider will do. Talk about things like you can expect them to ask questions about, you can expect them to talk about. Um, it may be similar to, um, but don't say you will get this, they will do this, you will have this type of treatment because that's, um, that's a mistake. Um, things in medical settings are really different than we're used to as advocates. The medical model is very uh, paternal. Uh, if you do what I say and take this pill I told you to take, you will get better. That's very opposite of how we function about uh, wanting people to make their own decisions and not being directed as advocates. So sometimes um, your perspective and a medical perspective are going to, they're going to clash a little bit. And so understanding that that's just their model, just like we have our model that we work from. Uh, remember that you're going to see a wide variation in the providers and experience and training depending on who the providers are in your community. If you have some evaluations that are conducted by specialized providers, they're going to look considerably different than if the evaluation happens on an emergent basis in the emergency room with the ER doctor. Um, so you knowing what best practice is can help make sure that your client receives the best regardless of what the setting is. And then if you think that something isn't being covered or something isn't happening the way that, that you're familiar with or the way that you would expect, ask. Don't ask in front of the patient because you don't want to put the medical provider on the spot in front of the patient, but ask for a moment to, to step out and talk with them and say, you know, I'm really used to um, working with providers who um, offer emergency contraception, and I didn't hear you do that. So I'm just following up on that. So if you, if you think there's some piece missing that you would expect to happen based on what you know and it's not happening, find out why. There may be a really good medical reason for that that the provider just didn't explain. And if they didn't explain it and you don't know it, then the patient probably doesn't know it either. So sometimes they just get going and they, they don't explain everything. So ask and ask for that reasoning and explanation. And most importantly, as an advocate, um, we can be supportive of medical providers doing evaluations in most cases. So we want to make sure that medical providers are making medical decisions and that we're advocating for the best interest of our client, which is most often to have a medical evaluation. Thank you very much for your participation in the webinar today, and I hope you gained some valuable information.